Well, good afternoon, church. It's an unexpected privilege to be here uh, today. Unfortunately, Michelle uh, has been too unwell uh, this week to prepare and to bring us God's word. But by the grace of God, both she and Paul are uh, recovering and uh, we continue to pray for those and, of course, others in our church family who are unwell at this time. So we're continuing our Frontline Sermon series today. We're reaching the halfway point as we continue to build on the foundations that are laid at our church weekend back in May. In the first of the Frontline Sermon Sundays, uh, I talked about how as Christians we make all of the difference in the world even though we are a minority within the population. As we are scattered each week, we may appear diluted, yet we are in fact in contact with way more people who do not know the Lord. Of course, it's vital that we come together as the body of Christ to be refreshed, refueled and renewed before we scatter once again. We are called by God. Peter addresses his first letter to the elect or the chosen. And like the Israelites captured by in Babylon, we too are exiles in a foreign land as we go from here and out onto our front lines. I hope that you might remember that during that service we also placed a sticker on the map of Basildon, or we wrote the places. Uh, where we consider our front lines to be. And now we can see just how far we do scatter as we go from here. The LICC represent the gathered and the scattered church through their red dots concept. You will no doubt remember the slides which, pow uh, which provide a, a powerful visualisation of how we are in contact with more people when we are scattered and how this provides more opportunities for talk of our faith. In the second sermon, a couple of weeks back, Joel talked about what it meant to be a Christian wherever we are. He reflected on the story in Genesis of how Jacob met God in the unlikeliest of places whilst he was running away after tricking his older brother Esau out of his birthright. Joel reminded us that very often God meets us when we least expect it. And he transforms those ordinary places that we go into, holy places. But we do need to see these places with fresh eyes, with kingdom eyes. Joel reminded us that God is present in our everyday places, the thick and the thin spaces. And it is often the most unexpected places where we can encounter God and to see the wonderful transformation in their lives of those who come to know him. But we must seize these opportunities and be intentional about talking about Jesus when we sense the Holy Spirit at work beside us. So today, I'm going to move us on and as we talk about being a red dot in whatever we do. So let's get into the Word of God. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Now I've asked Luke to come and read to us today. So uh, uh, whilst you're uh, preparing yourselves and Luke is uh, coming down to the front, uh, we're going to be reading from verses 15 through to 24. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called to one body. And be thankful. Let the word of the Lord dwell in, in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. 
Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey all things, your masters according to the flesh. Do not, do, um, sorry, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that, the, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve, sorry, for you. Serve the Lord Christ. Thank you. Amen. So, how many people did it take to enable Neil Armstrong to take that one small step for a man, but one giant leap for mankind as he stepped onto the surface of the moon? Well, according to the BBC documentary, at its height, NASA estimates the total of 400,000 men and women across the United States were involved in the Apollo program. You see, that number includes everyone from astronauts to mission controllers, contractors to caterers, engineers, scientists, nurses, doctors, mathematicians, and computer programmers. Consider just a single aspect of the Apollo 11 mission, the lunar landing. Armstrong's right-hand man in the lander was Buzz Aldrin. On the ground, there was a room full of mission controllers. Behind this core team of 20 to 30 per shift were hundreds of engineers in Houston and a team in Boston advising on computer alarms. Mission control was supported by communication ground stations around the world. The engineering team at the Grumman Corporation that built the lander and all of their subcontractors. And in support staff, from senior managers to the people selling coffee. And already, there are thousands involved. Multiply that by all of the different components of the endeavor, from rockets to spacesuits, communications to fuel, design to training, launch to splashdown, and 400,000 seems almost a modest figure. Well, perhaps 400,001. Because when President Kennedy visited NASA, he spotted a janitor and he walked over to him and said, Hi, I'm Jack Kennedy. What are you doing? And the janitor responded, Well, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. In that one sentence, the man connected his work to the main purpose of all NASA employees. And he knew it mattered. 400,000 people supporting the actions of just one man. That janitor knew that his work mattered and he wasn't afraid to say so, no matter how seemingly insignificant. As Christians, all the work we do matters. Most of the people hearing Paul's letter being read out to the church at Colossae would have been slaves. The household servants. And despite their seemingly low status in many ways, they kept the economy of the Roman Empire going. But they had very little control over their lives. It must have been very tempting for them to think that their daily tasks were insignificant. But Paul's encouragement offered them a new way of seeing these daily tasks and that they mattered. The book of Colossians was written by Paul whilst he was in prison in Rome. The church at Colossae had been infiltrated by a combination of different ideas from other religions and philosophies, which meant that the Christian truth of Christ as Lord and Saviour was weakened, and he needed to correct that false teaching. He teaches in chapter 1 that Christ is the Son, who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation, the creator who in him all things hold together. 
He is the head of the body, the church, the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. On the cross, Christ paid for our sin, and through that sacrificial act of love, Christ has reconciled us to God. Christ shows us how to live and grow spiritually and what we need to become as we slowly transform into the likeness of Jesus. And against this backdrop, Paul goes on to reveal practical teaching of what this should mean to us through the outworkings of our lives as Christians. The early part of Colossians chapter 3 states how truth, love and peace should mark out our lives and that as Christians we put to death our earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed so that we can commit ourselves to what Christ teaches. We are to rid ourselves of our old life and put on a new way given by Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. We are called to put our new self when we give our lives to Christ and we guard our earthly tendencies to be dead and buried as we are resurrected in Christ, changing our moral and ethical behaviours as we invite Christ to live within us and to shape us to be what we should be. In verses 12 to 17, Paul gives us a strategy to help us live for God. He tells us that we need to imitate Christ's compassionate and forgiving attitude. Let love guide your life. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Always be thankful and live as a representative of Jesus Christ. And if we adopt this strategy... Whatever we do, we will do it with all of our heart as we work for the Lord. And that really matters because that is how we witness Jesus as we go about our lives, on our front lines and with those we encounter on a day-to-day basis. If we are to do this well, we must first get ourselves straight. And by that I mean we as the body of Christ, as Christians and fellow believers. Now here at KBC, you'll hear us talking about our four Ps, prophecy, purpose, priorities and pursuits. And one of our priorities, or the reasons that we exist, is that we are a place to grow in living for Jesus and as a follower of Jesus. So as we gather, it is vital we are in a place of unity so that we may build one another up Encourage, nurture, equip, and then we can go out and we can make all of the difference wherever we are, whatever we do. Paul urges us in chapter 4 of his letter to the Ephesians to live a life worthy of the calling we have received. To be completely humble and gentle, patient and bearing with one another in love, and to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, that there is one body and one Spirit. In verses 12 to 14 of Colossians chapter 3, Paul gives eight positive traits which Christians are to emulate. Now in verses 15 and 16, he adds two more ideals for believers to pursue. First, he calls believers to live in peace. Verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Peace. Part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's noted in this letter as coming from God our Father in chapter 1, verse 2. And we receive peace with God through the blood of the cross chapter 1, verse 20. He says it is to rule in our hearts, meaning that it should be in charge of how we live. Paul is not referring to peace in the sense of happy feelings. He has already told us that as Christians we are to tolerate, love and support each other, and that we are not called to live in squabbles amongst each other, but in peace. 
With Christ as the head, we are all part of a spiritual body, which is the church. Peace within the body requires peace between its parts, and Paul wants the believers to let Christ's peace arbitrate and decide any argument, and to restrain any of the passions of the old nature that might threaten that unity. The heart is the centre of a person's being and the centre of our spiritual and moral life. And if peace rules there, then it rules every believer's entire life and by extension the life of the church and ultimately how we witness to others. And so it's vital that as we go from here each week, having been refreshed and refuelled by the time that we spend in worship, in prayer, in God's word, and in fellowship, that we go as a body in unity. And Paul tells us that we should do this with thanksgiving, showing the importance of gratitude in the Christian life, a point that is reiterated from his letter to the Ephesian church in chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, which says, Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 17 starts with this phrase which is at the heart of this message today. And it appears twice in the scriptures that we've read. Whatever you do. It says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, we see the phrase, whatever you do, again. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We are called to bring honour to Christ in every aspect and activity of our daily lives. We always represent Christ wherever we go and whatever we say and whatever we do. So what impression are we giving when people see or hear the way we behave? You may remember when I spoke last time that I said there was no such thing as a secular job. It's all sacred work. So every time we go from here out to our front line, whether that is the office, the factory, the swimming pool, or the school gates to pick up grandchildren, or visiting people in hospital, we are all ambassadors for Christ. Perhaps as Christians we might sometimes feel that our everyday tasks are important, but that ultimately they don't really matter to God. Perhaps we are living with this sense of sacred secular divide. And Paul is seeking to destroy that perspective. He wants us to see that regardless of what we do, significant or not, it is all sacred work and it matters to God. God has placed each of us where he has for a purpose so that he may work through us. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works for which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2.10 How many times have you gone to work and felt that God hasn't joined you there? And then there are the temptations all around you. Opportunities to cut corners or to scroll on your phone or to spend longer at the tea point than you should. And then the office conversation is mostly gossip and judgment upon others. But as a Christian, surely you believe that God is sovereign over all things. And if that is the case, then surely this means that you also believe that he is sovereign over putting you there in that job in the first place. Or in giving you grandchildren to collect from the school. Or in placing you in a friendship where you are uh, supporting someone who is having a really bad time. Your front lines are not only how God works through you, but they are also places where God works inside of you, changing you and shaping you from the inside to the out in the image of Christ. And at those times, you may think that he is distant or even absent, 
but rest assured because he is not. He is using those pressures in your job or the challenges in you, looking after the grandchildren or the emotional strain in listening to you, and uh, sorry, in listening to your friend to focus you in six key areas. Number one, God is using your front line to focus your faith. There is no meaningless moments when you look at life through the light of Jesus. God created us to live for him and his glory, and that is our chief calling. He set us aside, and whatever we do, we do it for his glory, even the mundane and the difficult. The great saints of the Bible glorified him while shipwrecked at sea, or sitting in jail, or herding sheep. God's glory motivates us to do great things and it reminds us of our ultimate reward. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That's 2 Corinthians 4.17. Number two, God is using your front line to focus your heart. Paul was compelled by the love of Christ which set him in motion to do great things, and it should do the same to us. When we are beaten down and uninspired or tempted to give up, remember, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. If you're feeling uninspired because of the hardship, consider Hebrews 12, verse 2. He endured cross. Number three, God is using your front line to focus your hands. Our hands are the tools through which we do the work we are called to do. And this reflects what we believe in our hearts. Our work is ultimately an offering to God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. If work is done for the wrong reasons, we will be disappointed. God is worthy of doing great things for him each and every day. And this is an act of worship and praise. Number four, God is using your front line to focus your love. Your work and how you do it affects other people. Some of your colleagues might produce great results, but in that process, others get hurt. As Christians, we're called to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you think your work is too small to make a difference, consider the great effect of the kindness and mercy shown by Boaz to Ruth. Number five, God is using your front line to focus your mind. Maybe your front line is too great a challenge to change physically. Then perhaps a change of how you think about it is required. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How often do we only see what is physically around us when we should be looking for the kingdom view? And finally, number six, God is using your front line to focus your witness. 2 Corinthians 10 uh, uh, verses 13 to 16 shows us that we each have a sphere of influence, a place where we have been set down to do the work of God and to witness well to those who have little regard for God or because the work they, uh, they do is all that they have to trust. You are there to show a different way to live. We're going to look at a video uh, now just to catch up with our four red dot characters. So. <laughs> Father, help me do good today. I want to shape this place to your design. Help me see the value my work has to you. May I model your kindness and patience. So that you are recognised. 
<laughs> May they know Jesus through my presence. May they see your light as I share mine. Give me your joy and self-control. So that your warmth touches those I meet. Help me to be generous. Quick to put others first. Sharing clearly your love and grace. Give me words to speak about you. And courage to stand for justice and truth. Whatever the day brings. In my humanity. Weakness. Breakthrough. Let my life overflow with you. Film, which is formed like a prayer, we see the four characters going about their daily tasks. They remind us that so often it is through what we do uh, that God gets what he wants done in the world. Did you notice how the characters recognise the value of their tasks in God's economy and that we are seeking God's wisdom, uh, uh, sorry, that they were seeking God's wisdom on how to serve him well? We're no different. Every opportunity is a sacred opportunity, whether we intentionally speak to people about Jesus or not. The way we behave and the way we speak should be as though it were Jesus standing in our place. And if we get the opportunity to speak to people of our faith, then it is not for us to convict our friend or colleague, but it is for the work of the Holy Spirit, and we need to give him room to do God's work. Now, in the second part of the scripture for today, Paul gives rules for three sets of household relationships, husbands and wives, parents and children, and masters and slaves. And whilst these are, of course, important, you'll probably not be surprised to learn that I'm going to skip past these today, not least because they would require much more time to explore properly, but also they're not particularly key to the overall message that I wanted to bring. But what I will say, in each case, it helps us to see the importance of mutual responsibility to submit and to love, to obey and to encourage, to work hard and fair. Regardless of the frontline situation that you find yourself in, these are applicable in how we are called to deal with one another, both as Christians in fellowship, but also with those who we encounter outside of our faith. Paul begins his instructions with the home and the family, then moves outwards towards colleagues, employers and employees, before finally reaching a position where he is seeking to reach outsiders as he seeks God to open doors for the message and to proclaim the mystery of Christ Jesus in chapter 4, verse 4. Now before I close, let me move on to verses 23 and 24. Now, whenever we see things in the Bible that are repeated, generally it's because God wants us to sit up and take notice. And so it's significant that this phrase, whatever you do, is repeated a second time in Colossians 3. We've already addressed it when it came first in 3.17, where the whatever is in a worship context. Verse 15 refers to the body of Christ, and 16 refers to the word of Christ in teaching and in admonish, admonishing one another uh, with the wisdom through psalms, hymns, and the songs from the Spirit. Paul then repeats this idea in, in, in verse 23. But in this context, it relates to the everyday working environment that the household slaves found themselves in. He explains that Christ transcends all divisions between people. Slaves are told to work hard, regardless of whether they are being watched or not, and to do so with a heart and reverence for the Lord. And as we see in verse 1 of chapter 4, the masters are instructed to be right and fair because everyone is accountable to God. God has provided work for us all, and if we treat that work as worship or an act of service to God, then we will find ourselves enjoying the work without having to endure the drudgery of the most tedious of tasks. Paul knew that whatever early Christians were doing in worship, 
in work and indeed in all of life. This was significant to God. And what made the difference was doing all of these things as they were working for the Lord. Today's work and front lines are different. But that commitment to Jesus as Lord remains the same. Whatever you do, whether it is in our gathered worship or in our scattered everyday lives, it all matters whatever we do. As the worship team return to lead us in response, let me tell you about the takeaway this week. In week one, I suggested that you could take your red dot coaster to your front line and you could use it as a talking point of your faith. In week two, Joel gave us a postcard to take away for you to write about how you experience God's presence, where your pressure points are, and the purpose why God has you there right now. This week, you can collect a pencil on your way out. In my view, arguably, the most practical item so far. Perhaps you will use this pencil for notes and tasks on your front line. Treat it as a reminder that whatever we do, we should do it for the glory of God. Every time you see this pencil, let it be a prompt for your thankful prayer that God is interested in all that we do, and especially in what we do on our front lines. So in closing, Paul's letter to Colossians describes the kind of community God was calling them to be. He makes clear that this was not just an inward-focusing community and that their daily lives were to be marked by love, kindness and compassion in their places of work and in their relationships. The social conditions that then aren't the same as most of us face today. However, the principles are just as applicable now. Our commitment to Jesus as Lord is to be worked out in our daily life in relationship with others, and bound up in our service of Jesus himself. When we do something in the name of Jesus, we are his ambassadors, and we can parent our children or be a friend in his name. We can price a job or run a business meeting in his name. We can plumb a sink in his name. We can coach a team in his name. What does it mean to you to do daily tasks in Jesus' name? Whatever we do, let us do it in Jesus' name. Whatever we do, let us do it as worship. Whatever we do, let us do it for God the Servant King. Let us bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Let us pray together the words on the screen. Lord, as we scatter to our frontline places, we thank you for the many opportunities to do good in the world. Whatever the tasks of our week, wherever we are, we pray that you will work through them and they will bear fruit for your kingdom. May we do all things attentive to your presence and with a heart set on working at them for you, first and foremost. Amen. Thank you, Julie.